And here I am with video this time, Monique van der Stad. I'm going to moderate a super interesting session on environmental performance in TV broadcasting, where we will both touch on the TV broadcasting production side, as well as on the whole technology side that is connected. All right. So there was a bit of an echo there. Solved it right now. Let me first introduce two fantastic guests with a lot of expertise. Will Ennett of Talk Talk and Eileen Duggan of RTE. Now, let's start with Will. Will, Talk Talk, you've been there for a long time. It's a broadcaster based on a telecom company that has expanded and offers loads of services. For those in Europe that don't know Talk Talk, maybe you can briefly explain what they do. Yeah, hi, thanks, Monique. So, my name is Will Ennett and I'm head of sustainability at Talk Talk. Uh, Talk Talk is a UK-based uh, internet service provider. So uh, we uh, provide uh, internet for uh, homes as well as businesses, as well as uh, a television service, which runs over DTT as well as IP. Very good. So you, you basically have the whole thing from TV to telecom and everything in between, connecting everybody. And Eileen Duggan at RTE, the uh, Irish public broadcaster, you have been at RTE forever <laughs> you, you know how this company has changed what is your yes. responsibility right now because you've done a lot of different things there what is your responsibility right now okay i am the sustainability and environmental services manager for rte um rte is like a huge domestic environment because the core business we provide is program making um we're not like a factory which you know manufactures particular products so we have a very diverse waste impact and environmental impact and um, we try to manage that as best we can. Okay, now first of all, the good news of course is that you guys exist, that this function at these companies does now exist, the sustainability manager. How long have you both been in this role? I mean, how long has, have both the companies decided, oh, we're going to do something about this? Will. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've been doing the role uh, around about a, a year and my background before then uh, was on TV. So uh, at one stage I was you know, running the TV uh, division at Talk Talk. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a great pleasure to... to and and was, was there somebody before you or are you the first sustainability manager? Um, yes, I am the kind of inaugural role. Ah. Uh, so and and when you started, did you get like Here's 10 million budget to solve all our problems. Or do you have budget? Do you have authority? What is given to you to make all this happen? Because it's not a small task. Yeah, I think, look, it's a great, it's a great question. I think the key is actually understanding. And 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 the the reason why I think the role, the role is very timely and the role is for now, is because uh, you know, as a business, we've actually been focusing on what's called our scope one and scope two. So for those who don't know, that's your like direct emissions that you emit in your business. Uh, for well over a decade, reporting on that. And that's largely been driven by um, a, a, you know, a relatively small team that particularly run the data centers in our business. And they've done actually an incredible job. So I must give them a, a praise on this forum. And, and we've, we've seen a over 60% drop in our emissions in five years in that scope. Ooh, that's but amazing. What, yeah, so really, you know, quite, Quite, quite uh, amazing. But um, the, the nature of the environmental response is really changing. And so particularly now, if we look at scope three, which is your indirect emissions, that's the majority of our emissions. Uh, you know, we're now at the stage of really calculating that, refining that, making public pledges to reduce those. And that's when you have to look into your supply chain, look into how your customers use your products, which I'm sure we'll talk about as well. Yeah. And so that's probably where, where I was able to come in and, and, and help uh, to um, help challenge some of those wider uh, indirect emissions and the changing nature of it. So. so for now, your role is actually mostly helping the company understand what they can do beyond uh, the emissions from their direct operations uh, on site. Uh, yeah, that's right, because that's by far and away the biggest. So, um, you know, what that means is really working very closely with our largest suppliers, but then also, um, you know, our, our equipment and devices, which will come to uh, no doubt shortly. So the yep. residential devices, the routers, the set-top boxes, they have a really big impact as well. And so again, how do we work with the manufacturers? How do we get, you know, balance both, you know, energy efficiency, 
with price and quality. And those last yeah. two are probably the ones that most telcos absolutely must tick the box with, with every product they bring to market. I think increasingly um, understanding both environmental, but also social values, right? You know, that there's a supply chain is, is free of things like, you know, um, slavery and, and actually good social Before values. you know it, you have to save the whole planet. That's exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's a big, Eileen, at RTE, what, what is your role exactly? What, what do you have a big remit? Do, does everybody in the company have to listen to you? What can you decide without others having to say, oh no, we don't want to do that. Can you tell us a little bit what your role is? Well, RTE management operates as a team. And um, I think generally with regard to sustainability, the whole organization has to be part of it. So um, our strategy is linked to best practice and uh, collaboration with our colleagues and keeping everyone up to date. Our communications department play a huge role in relaying information to everybody. And uh, the team I work with in property and services, uh, we work very much conjoined in the context of energy management, uh, waste management, biodiversity, and all the pillars of um, uh, environmental performance. So we tend to focus on working together and we have very good governance within the organization and ethical leadership in the context of sustainability. Okay, that, that's great to hear. And, and over the last few years, if you describe what is the biggest change that has happened because of uh, this approach, I mean, what is now being done completely differently or much better than five years ago? What has been the biggest change there? I think in some ways, for many years, I've been working on the same thing, uh, which was recycling and waste management and best practice. Um, but what I've noticed in the most recent years is that we can refine our focus more and look at other aspects like energy performance. And a biggie for us was um, ISO 50001. Um, that's internationally recognized as a very high standard in energy management. And for many years before that, our team had been working in that area. But it's when you get certified that you then get recognized for what you're really doing. So I think in that context, um, I think that that has been a big thing for us all. Yeah, and then it also means that within the, the bigger framework of, for example, all the European public broadcasters, you can actually set the example and show what you've learned and help them also reach that, that very high level. Right? I think it's also an example of um, being aware of your um, environmental impact, because if you are doing energy audits and focusing on where mm -hmm. your, um, your carbon is and the opportunities, your list of opportunities, you can then act on this and make measured and informed decisions. Yep, yep. Okay, if maybe the both of you, you have different areas uh, that you are experts in on what actually goes wrong and where we can improve. And the improvement levels are both on the production level, on the equipment level, on the energy level. I mean, many, many different elements that we can change. I'm talk talking to Will first because you are very much aware of that whole electronic digital world that we now live in, where we consume a lot of stream services, video services via different networks. Uh, we have all across Europe, these huge server farms now that, you know, really break down whole energy grids at the moment in Amsterdam. They actually have to move away uh, different areas because there's whole areas that they can't give energy anymore because of these huge server farms. So. You know this industry really well. If you talk from that part of the industry, the telecom part, you know, the, the actual where it gets distributed, what can we do? You already said you can actually do things, but what can we do there? Yeah, thank you. And I definitely, you know, echo, and I know Eileen, I, I know in Ireland as well, with all the, the big US multinationals, there's a lot of um, concern about, you know, the sheer energy consumption and how energy hungry these data centers are. So it's absolutely a concern, but I would be uh, more optimistic in that I think if you look at this industry and you compare it maybe to some other industries, which to reach net zero goals are going to have to fundamentally change the way they operate. 
I'm not sure that for the internet, for the telecoms industry and for the broadcasting industry, we're under quite the same, uh, um, let's call it sort of fundamental dilemmas. And actually it, it, we, we can get there. And so we, we all, it is all incumbent upon us to do that. So uh, this year, uh, a few months ago, I collaborated with some other businesses, BT, Orange, um, Ericsson, and uh, Facebook as well, uh, and uh, along with the UN Climate Champions, we created what's called the Net Zero Pathway. So that's how the telecoms industry can get to net zero by the 2040s globally. So, so, so you feel in... that's possible? I mean, because in my, yeah. in my view, the telecom industry could never go to net zero because it will always need lots and lots of energy, right? So how would how can telecoms go to net zero? Yeah, well, I think the critical point about it is the energy, and that was what's attributed to up to 80% of that goal is the switch to renewable energy and the push on energy efficiency. So it's very, it's actually quite straightforward in many respects. Yeah. And so, you know, I know that, you know, in our case, we, we've switched to uh, the, we take that those savings we've made in our operations, they're largely driven by um, energy efficiency, consolidating data centers, looking at what we're doing in there. And then now we've then made a further switch to renewable energy, which will then see another big drop. Um, and so again, you know, we, I, I notice a lot of telecoms companies around Europe are already on uh, renewable energy and they're really sort of pushing down the energy efficiency because that's, I think, this paradox you see um, out there. Because uh, again, I think there's an assumption that look, for every additional bit of data, it equals consumption. So therefore, that means our emissions must be getting worse. But what you're seeing is a bit of a, 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 a a crossroads where that's not happening and in fact um, a lot of european telecoms companies emissions even in scope three are reducing not increasing and so why is that and it's because see the move to renewable energy move to energy efficiency means that um, it, it is possible there's still other big challenges and so you know we need to tackle the supply chain was the second key call out and the third key call out was e-waste or you know all those electronic devices and absolutely yeah. you know we need to embrace um, circular practices, so really uh, improving the amount that uh, devices, you know, in any uh, of the broadcasting and, and internet and telecoms uh, world, whether that's in the back office at the networks or in the front office, so the, uh, the routers, the set-top boxes, the TV sets and customers' homes, the tablets, uh, really are, are much better at like refurbishment, you know, reuse, and then recycling as well. So you cover, I mean, because that latter part is partly also with consumers we can mm. discuss that later on how industry can work with consumers and also improve their habits but the complete other side i mean obviously the telecom industry uh loves to spend less energy i mean that makes their yeah. their business better so you yeah. know there's an innate driver there but um is there also a, a technological development where you can see these things becoming more efficient because I'm thinking of, okay, we have 5G coming and everybody is already streaming everywhere all the time. And I mean, in one of the previous panels, um, uh, edge computing was mentioned as a way, you know, we should actually reorganize the whole architecture of the telecom industry to make sure that we have stuff delivered in the most efficient way. Is that happening at your side as well? Oh, uh, you know, the, the edge computer is a good, good question. And, and I wish that our, our CTO is on the, on the call. I mean, what, what I can <laughs> say is we... Uh, we published a report uh, uh, actually about two weeks ago where we, we did some work and we brought in a third party consultancy just to verify our work. And what we found is in the UK, at least, we're pushing for this um, fiber to the home or fiber to the premise. Now, I, I appreciate in other European countries that it's much further along than in the UK. Um, but uh, and so replacing out the copper, uh, uh, you know, yeah. the traditional copper lines. And what we've seen is an up to 80% reduction in uh, energy usage and, you know, associated. Oh, so emissions. simply having the fiber reduces well, the energy that's needed I think, to, I think to get the signals it, out. There. Yeah, it's kind of three three key things is the first, the, the biggest impact is actually um, uh, the, the equipment. So we've got r uh, like rails and rails and rails. And I was actually at one this morning, just taking another look of old MSAN kits, like, you know, just as far as the eye can see for every exchange replaced with a, you know, a, t a much much smaller box for, for fiber to the home so just removing all that that energy in the in the exchanges um, the actual line itself you know you need energy to power a copper line you don't need that in the same extent on fiber optic okay. and then the third one is the resilience we just see a lot fewer engineers doing you know repair jobs mileage just saving you know petrol and all those emissions um, on yeah. on repairs so so yeah so i think again you know 
I, I'm not trying to sound too, um, you know, bombastic about, you know, the future is great and there's nothing to worry about. Of course, you know, we, we all have to do things, but wh where I'm optimistic is, you know, if, if we can do the right actions, uh, embrace energy efficiency, uh, use the, the, the good news is these newer networks tend to be more energy efficient, which is a great tick box. And then we just got to focus, I think, on our supply chain and on, uh, as I said, electronic waste as well. And uh, just, sorry, one last stat for that is, again, we've done a, a piece of work internally where we looked at um, our devices, you know, the, the routers we send out, and we found it's 18 times more carbon efficient to reuse and refurbish a device than to manufacture a new one. Ah, so it's okay. a huge yeah. climate saving, as well as Frank being very honest, you know, cost saving for us to get the devices back and to uh, and, and to give them a new and life, give them a new yeah. home. You yeah. Know? Yeah, so, yeah. 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 And and not have everybody in their shed have all boxes lying around just in case, because you never know. <laughs> well, exactly. There, there, there are attics, you know, <laughs> across exactly. Europe full of all these decoders, devices. you know, decoders exactly. Everywhere. And, and yeah. uh, you know, we just want to make sure that doesn't happen again. Yeah. OK, well, very good. Eileen, this is the whole infrastructure that underlies the distribution. RTE itself is, of course, mainly looking at the production side of things. You know, how do you make the programs also get them to the end user? And you managed, uh, you mentioned uh, waste as a very specific area that you have done a lot of work in. Is is there so much waste in the production industry? I mean, is is audiovisual industry one where waste is such a big problem? Well, I think there's um, several definitions of waste. And what I would define the waste from an environmental perspective is waste, anything that's waste, um, whether it's waste energy, whether it's waste product, um, whether it's waste time, everything has an environmental impact if it's, if it's, it's about resource efficiency, really. Um, and I think it, this actually touches upon the type of things that we buy. Um, if we buy stuff that ends up as waste a year after buying it, then that's wasteful um, and it's not good resource management. But if we buy stuff that has uh, longevity, uh, we reduce our waste, residual waste, then if that product lasts a year longer, we've reduced our waste by that percentage. So I think the whole uh, concept of waste needs to be not at the compound. It needs to be when the, the products are being procured so as that we can look at products and services of what we're buying or doing and assess it and say, is this product uh, needed for starters? Um, is there a better way and a more sustainable way of doing this? Um, and then having decided what we need to procure, we go and get the most sustainable uh, method of doing that. But elimination of waste is much better. And the principles of the circular economy are much more effective in the context of sustainability. Now, if, you, so, if you talk about procurement, and uh, I would assume that as a, a big buyer of, of products and services, you also have influence on the people that, you know, make those products. I mean, if you say we only are going to buy this kind of thing, more people will say, okay, in that case, I'm going to make it. Is this something that you as an audiovisual organization can do alone? Or is this something where you can actually team up with other big buyers to make it more of a market force to force the suppliers to be more sustainable in everything they do? Because it's okay. all about yourself. Eh? It's about okay. how you influence the market out there. Well, we are governed obviously by procurement rules. Um, and But within that framework, we would uh, allocate a certain criteria uh, to the award, uh, the awarding of contracts in the context of uh, sustainability. And this has been uh, multiplied in its uh, value in the context of our need to address our scope three emissions. Um, because when we have recently done an exercise to assess our scope three impact and this tells us that you know this is where we are now but going forward we want to reduce any impact or reduce as best we can to best practice uh, the impact of our suppliers so the only way we can do this is through our procurement process yeah. and um 
just on the other uh, mention that you said about can we collaborate with other um, organizations, I do think that, um, you know, we have collaborated, not so much in the procurement sense, uh, but with other broadcasters, we have um, worked with other broadcasters in Ireland and developed a consortium of broadcasters within Ireland. And it's through that consortium that we managed to bring Albert to Ireland, which was a help to us in the context of measuring the carbon impact of our programs. Yeah, so, for those of you that know, no, Albert is a, a tool where you can calculate your carbon and output, and it's developed by the BAFTA in the UK. Ireland is taking it over, but also in the Netherlands and Norway, it's now being used as a tool to, to organize these processes and understand them better. Um, but again, of course, the BAFTA cannot run all those countries. So what you need in every single country is actually a group of organizations that says, okay, let's do this, let's do this together and not go it alone, right? Yes, and I, I think that what's important and the main message I would have really would be that all organizations, large or small, should be aware of their energy impact and their waste impact. In other words, what are they doing that they don't need to do? Um, because well, what, it, one of the questions that, that was asked in, in uh, one of the sessions was, shouldn't we simply produce less, less audiovisual material? Because there's so much, but of course, that's the heart of the industry, to make programs and to get them to the people. Is this something that ever crosses your mind where you think like, oh, okay, the most effective thing we can do is actually do less of our core business? Very hard. I would say that um, that's a very broad question and a good question. Um, I think in its broadness, it would narrow down to, you know, individual areas in the context of what's right at the time. Um, and for the broadcaster. Um, I certainly think that no matter what someone is deciding to do, um, they need to look at the impact of that and to look at the best processes. And when they start doing that, I think industry will respond to that as well. Um, and certainly anything we bring into the organization that isn't used and ends up in the skips, um, you know, if I really want to see what waste is happening within the operations of a company, if they invite me to their waste yard where they keep their waste, I'd say there's very good messages in there about what shouldn't be happening. <laughs> because, because it is that, that phase three uh, area where you not only look at your own you know, production, but actually check all your suppliers, you also yes. need so much information from them. That means your caterer should, caterer should drive electric cars. And I mean, it goes beyond what would be the normal requirement to ask of any uh, supplier, right? So you, you, you are out there, you know, feeling all the data of all these different organizations. Yes, I, I think that uh, there's so many pillars for sustainability. There's transport and travel. You have biodiversity, you have water, you have waste, you have energy. You have all these pillars and, you know, there's it's always, all, sometimes there's is. good things to do and very, you know, um, important things to do in some areas and in other areas, they might be a bit weaker in the potential. Um, so I agree with you. I think that transport is, there's a huge focus on transport and, and now at the moment. And I think where COVID has probably slowed some of that down, um, it still is an issue. And I know that uh, there's much more emphasis now on electric vehicles, definitely, yeah. Will, if you look at, at the power that you as a more telecom oriented organization says, do you actually feel that, um, and also, I, in view of that UN report, you know, you take the, the big scale development. Do you feel that the industry can actually help stimulate the equipment makers and the other people, that suppliers from that part of the industry to be more energy efficient or more sustainable? Do you see a role there for the telecom industry to do that? I think, I think that if companies do what they should be doing, which is looking for sustainable uh, resources and sustainable methods. Um, I believe that 
obviously the bigger the company is, the stronger the buying potential they have and the purchasing power. Yeah, that's they have. for the supply side. I'm just yeah. wondering for Will if the equipment side also. I would presume it down. would. I would presume it does. Let's, let's hear from Will. Let's hear from yeah. Will. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, you know, what's quite interesting is that we're both obviously a purchaser. Um, and so we are a customer within the supply chain, but we're also a supplier within the supply chain. And so we provide lots of large businesses in the UK with uh, connectivity, with internet services, and we also provide white label services. And so we can see as a supplier a real increase in the last 12 months in terms of questions and real um, desire by the businesses to understand, look, are we a sustainable business? Is the product that we're buying, uh, you know, that this that we're selling to the to, to our client, is that sustainable? And do do we as Talk Talk have have a credible plan to reduce those? So that I think for me is the is again why I'm probably optimistic than looking at our supply chain because I can tell that you know there's pressure coming from us, and I can also tell when I'm working with the um, a lot of the uh, equipment manufacturers that we that we deal with. And, uh, you know, recently with a couple of them, I've been asking various questions and just like that, they, they've got the data to hand. And so there are, but where there are other parts of the supply chain, maybe other parts of, of industries that we don't usually deal with that are not maybe absolutely critical to creating a, a, a service, whether it's a broadcasting service or a telecom service, uh, you know, I, I won't name names, but just uh, other industries that are not sort of in, in, in our bubble. And I found it probably a bit more, a bit harder to get some of that data. Yeah. So yes, I do think so. But also, again, look, each each company be very different. You know, Talk Talk uh, as a business, um, we have a a, um, a supply chain which is quite weighted towards other telecoms companies and other big companies like Amazon, Microsoft. Um, you know, big. So you know, I'm not going to go up to them and tell them <laughs> how to yeah. calculate their emissions. They'll have they'll have an army of people to do that, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so we're fortunate in that respect. So I think we also, um, what I would just say to, to people watching is, you know, what we've tried to do is let's focus on um, our biggest source of emissions within the supply chain, which usually follows the spend. So who do we spend the most with? And how do we come up with a credible plan that's quite granular and that we can reduce? And then let's go to the SMEs because also the SMEs, look, they've had a pretty horrid 18 months. They've got lots and lots of problems yeah. and things on their plate right now. So we're not approaching them just yet, but that's not because we don't care. It's just because I think, you know, there's probably bigger fish to fry, but certainly next year we'd like to do more on that ground too. Uh, and I'm trying to help yeah. them rather than just demand, you know, also maybe see, yeah. look, is there ways that we can help? Yeah, yeah. Because, because on the whole, I mean, it's not just for the audiovisual industry, but it feels like a system change. Hmm. And it's always interesting to find out where are the, the concentrations of change? What are the, the flywheels? And sometimes, I mean, some things are on, on the global level and it's very hard to influence, but it's quite surprising to see how very often it's also on the, uh, on the level of people that know each other. I mean, if all the sustainable, sustainability managers in the audiovisual industry are in contact with each other, suddenly things start to happen much faster. So sometimes it is really uh, small and, and you know, it's an interesting time to, to live because it's both the industry and the people that are now having the same goal. Uh, we have a few minutes left and I do want to ask, uh, take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, um, please ask. And there's actually one that's already in the chat here. Um, covers a little bit what I said already, but is demand for sustainable products and practices coming from customers, shareholders, employees, legislators, or other stakeholders? Well, I cross my fingers from all of them, but in your view, where is it coming from, from both at RTE and Talk Talk point of view? Uh, I think from, our, from RTE's perspective, we have to respond to the people that we're serving, which are our viewers. Um, and I think our viewers expect uh, the national broadcaster to operate to a sustainable standard. So that's the driving force for us because we operate on the license fee and commercial and we, you know, apart from our inner uh, beliefs about the, you know, the appropriateness of sustainability, it is ultimately we're serving people. So we need to listen to our viewers and that voice is getting much louder lately. Uh, you know, there's the young people across the whole world are expressing this view because it's their planet too and it there needs to be something there for them. Yeah, it's a generation thing as well. But it's yeah. new. It's new that viewers and the bigger audience 
have sustainability on their mind. They might not always make the choices that go with it, but they, they know what it is and that it matters. Will, where do you see the most uh, pressure or demand coming from at the moment? Yeah, I would say it's a it's a mix. So to, to you know, I, I mentioned previously, so certainly our business clients, definitely a big, big focus there. Um, I would also say that, you know, it's quite interesting. We, we're now a private company. So we were a FTSE company. Uh, we've now gone private. Now our, our owners have signed up to, you know, things like, you know, UN based um, sort of uh, ESG practices. So there is there's some pressure there, but maybe not as much uh, as, as, a, as a maybe a, a public company would have. Um, and yeah, so I would say on, a, on the residential customer side, I think there's an interest. I, I'm not sure yet that uh, customers are picking a telecoms company or a broadcaster on the basis of their, of their environmental yeah. track record yet. Whereas I think in other industries like FMCG goods, that is absolutely happening. But having said that, um, the, the danger for any telecom companies, if they slip too far behind, um, they, they, will, they will start to lose business. So I think there is still a pressure point. Um, on the employee side, yes, we, we've got a what we call hashtag net zero heroes uh, internal employee group. And they're very active and they certainly keep me very honest. And, uh, you know, so definitely, you know, we, we did an internal piece of research. Uh, you know, we saw that by 2030 on the current trajectories, uh, Gen Z and, and uh, uh, yeah, that's the latest generations of Gen Z and millennials will be over 80% of our employee base. So we really have to kind of do something and do something for the future for our employees. And then I think on the legislation side, my, my sense is that from a, you know, because the telecoms broadcasting is not a high emitting sector, it's not going to be something where we're, quaking in our boots about carbon taxes, but certainly in the UK, there's the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, which you may have heard of, TCFD, that's coming down the line. Uh, and I believe there's sort of EU's equivalents. And so certainly there's a lot more paperwork and a lot more reporting and a lot more governance. And all that will do is I would think then bring the, the subject of sustainability much higher up uh, uh, the agenda because it will just have to be, you know, board minuted, you know, very frequently reported on very frequently. So I think the, the, the legislative um, drive is less about a punitive or about penalties, but more about actually in a, in a roundabout way, creating a lot more internal awareness. Yeah, and, and the transparency has to come along with sort of uh, standardized measuring systems because otherwise you cannot compare. So, it, and that's not just the broadcasting industry that goes for all industry, but if you cannot measure in the same way, then everybody can have good news. You know, everybody's 20% better than last year, but it doesn't mean anything if it's not transparent and better. Yeah, and I, 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 look, I appreciate there might be other questions. I, I think, look, everyone tends to use the greenhouse gas protocol. And I think there are, there's clearly, you know, at the COP, for example, there will be a few more guidelines that are given on certain items, certain aspects. So I, I just think that's a very soluble problem. I think in the next six to 12 months, we'll see a lot more, um, things where you can make clear and easy yeah. comparisons. Uh, but I agree with you that there are times where uh, companies may want to sort of deliberately bamboozle. <laughs> yeah. Oh, or even on the consumer, let I me mean, try to calculate your carbon footprint if you, you know, take a trip. It's almost impossible. Yeah. You know, it's almost impossible right now. It should be easier. It should so, be so much easier. Eileen, what about RTE? Where do you see uh, the next step well, going? RTE operates under the Broadcast Authority of Ireland. And the BAI has recently developed a sustainability network, which we are part of and have made commitments to in the context of our sustainability. And a huge amount is happening um, in context of compliance as well, because obviously, you know, in a democracy, people decide what they want. The, our viewers, our members of the public, and that eventually gets into legislation across the world. People realize and it becomes compliance. So it's a circular thing in itself. So from our perspective, I think um, we are very committed, but I think you know we're going to have to run a race of trying to stay a little bit ahead of compliance because you know compliance is there as well. So as a broadcaster, of course, you have a special role in the sense that you can also guide the audience and influence the audience yeah. in a way. Whereas for Talk Talk, it's more like showing and making, for instance, yeah. taking back things as more normal and, you know, yes. giving the best example. How is RTE very focused on taking the audience yes. along in the sustainability? Yes. Um, yes. And I believe that 
RTE and other broadcasters can do 10 times as much through their content as they can in the, for themselves as a business. So their content can contain messages of sustainability and uh, increase awareness of viewers. And I think whatever they can do as a business, um, they can multiply by 10 in context of, of making sure that that message goes into their content. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, different roles for different organizations, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have five minutes left. So I have a question. If somebody from the audience has a question, now would be the time to ask. But it's also for you guys. If there's anything you really want to share that I never asked about, now would be the time to tell us. And again, we have people from the industry listening and they're keen to hear your best stories, of course, as always. So, Will, if there's anything you want to add, now would be the time. If not, my question is, what is the very hardest thing at the moment? You know. But you might have I, I something can, better. <laughs> I, I can do. I can do both. So um, I think, yeah. Look, one thing that you you will see uh, a fair bit of is maybe a, a call to arms to customers to change. Let's say, if you downgrade your uh, video quality from HD to SD, you're helping to save the world. And um, you know, I, I'm just not sure that that is the right use of uh, of a customer's time and their power and their agency. You know, so that's certainly not something that we will be advocating. We're not telling customers to send one fewer email or anything like that. I think uh, you hit the nail on the head, Monique, early when you talked about systems change. So it really is, you know, we talked about, you know, the UN work, there's four big pillars of systems change. Um, and then again, you know, if you're a customer, and it's not that I'm here saying that I'm going to recommend X or Y, but certainly rather than look at going from HC to SD, think about, you know, is your home energy powered by renewable energy on a green energy contract. And again, you know, are you um, recycling your electronic devices? Are you sending them back to your operator when they're done? And then and thinking about, you know, the, the, the TV set itself, because again, when we looked at, um, we collaborated with a group called Dimpact in their first round of assessment where they did the carbon impact of video streaming. And that was the key conclusion. And it was less so on the network side, the data centers, the actual network, and much more so the impact on the consumer house side you know the, the end devices house. are actually where end devices. Big, so, yeah, exactly. so that would be my key takeaway for, for the industry and for, for for people at large you know if you do want to make a difference it's probably those those bigger changes there than just those minute things which might be uh not making a, a big impact yeah feels like you do something but you don't really do something mm. okay and eileen what's the hardest thing or what's the one thing you still want to say in the last well, i think minutes? one of the most important things um is what we're doing I think collaboration between industry and between the industry and other supporting industries. Um, I believe this type of uh, event and the amount of uh, messaging that comes from this um, is powerful and does make people think and make people reflect. And I think we cannot underestimate the value of that. Okay, thank you so much. If there's no more questions from the audience, I want to thank both of you. I want to thank everybody in the audience who's also working hard at all these topics and do feel free to connect to each other and to our two speakers because they have a, a lot more stories to share. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you Monique. Thanks bye everyone. Bye-bye.